Okay, we're talking about the Bankster Thieves today. And uh, so let's get going. Um, to lay a foundation for talking about the Bankster Thieves, we're going to talk about money. And um, this is taken from Black's Law Dictionary, second edition. A uh, dollar is the unit employed in the United States in calculating money values. It is coined both in gold or silver and is the value of 100 cents. Notice it says it's coined. It doesn't say anything about printing or digits. Uh, anyways, uh, this is taken from the Coin Jack of 1792. Uh, dollar each to be the value of a Spanish mill. Dollar is the same as now current and to contain 371 grains and 4 sixteenths part of a grain of pure or 416 grains of standard silver. Um, this is an English court case. At common law, only gold or silver were legal tender. In England, copper farthings, half pence were made legal tender under the value of six pence. And it goes on. Anyways, the point here is that it's this uh, first phrase here, it says at common law only gold or silver, gold and silver were legal tender. And that's found in Book Two of the Institutes, that's uh, Sir Edward Coke, uh, like in about the 1500s. Um, um, so that's this very old and very well established that at common law only, only gold or silver are legal tender. And that's very important. So if you accept, if you, these IOUs, this is all negotiable instrument law, we're going to go into this, and, uh, and there's no common law. When you use Federal Reserve notes or Bank of Canada notes, you just gave up common law. Anyways, this is a Kentucky court case, 1834. This court has heretofore repeatedly determined that the term money, although it may have a popular import, which in ordinary parlance means, or at least includes banknotes, yet... Uh, that it's true technical import is lawful money in the United States, in other words, gold or silver coin. And when used in judicial pre proceedings, it is always to be taken in this technical sense. Uh, another court case, Kentucky, that money in a strict legal sense means gold or silver coin, and that an obligation for money alone cannot be satisfied with anything else. Um, Another court case, Tennessee, 1835, the answer to this argument is that the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law and that no law can be valid which, in violation of that instrument, shall attempt to make anything but gold or silver coin a tender. And this is actually a Federal Reserve note. Um, um, this is, uh, I'm not sure what year, oh, 1934. Uh, anyways, uh, front and back, $1,000 one, eh? And if you look up here, uh, it says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money. Actually, we're going to go through what it says here in a minute. This is a, uh, a $10 note. Uh, looks uh, 1950, series 1950, and, and it says it's redeemable as well. It says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury at any Federal Reserve Bank. Um, this is a silver certificate, and uh, it says that uh, this certifies there is a deposit in the treasury of the United States of America, one dollar in silver payable to the bearer on demand. So this would be considered a promissory note because it's a promise to pay, payable to the bearer on demand. So that means you could go down and get your silver if you wanted. Um, this is a United States note, okay? And the difference is, is that um, there's no silver. There's no, this is on the full faith and credit of the United States Treasury. Um, and uh, this is, notice the ink is red. It's a little bit different. This is a 1963 series that was circulated during the Kennedy administration. Matter of fact, a lot of people think that's why he was killed. Um, because he circulated a bunch of these things. And the first thing that Johnson did when he got on the airplane after the Kennedy assassination was he recalled a bunch of them, although many people didn't turn them in, and I happened to have three. I was actually at a convenience store in Texas one day, and some lady, I guess she just wanted to get rid of it and went to spend it, and the clerk didn't know what it was. And, uh, and so I told the clerk I'd give him a $5 bill for that because... Uh, you know, it's kind of a collector's item. Anyways, so what is money? Uh, this note, these, this note here, these um, uh, United States notes and the silver certificates even say this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Um, and this is actually a Yugoslavia note. 
um, before the collapse of the Yugoslavia. This is basically, you know, what some people say is going to happen to a Federal Reserve note. Um, and notice it's uh, like five million, and uh, it's like almost worthless. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, somebody gave it to me. <laughs> so, what is lawful money, and what is legal tender? There's a difference. Uh, Federal Reserve notes. This is uh, uh, Russell O. Monk, Assistant General Counsel, Department of the Treasury, February 18, 1977. Federal Reserve notes are not dollars. Yeah, did you know that? Uh, the term dollars, likewise, is incorrect, which, according to constitutional definition, are monetary units used in exchange backed by gold or silver. Gold and silver are present-day fiat issues are supported by more printed paper. The same, therefore, they are correctly termed Federal Reserve notes, not dollars. This is taken from the Handbook of Financial Mathematics, Formulas and Tables, 1979. Uh, this is a... Uh, 1925 court case. Uh, Federal Reserve bank notes and other notes constituting a part of the common currency of a country are recognized as good tender for money unless specifically objected to. Okay, so it's voluntary. You do not have to accept those things unless specifically objected to. Um, um, there is a distinction between a debt discharge and one paid. When discharged, the debt still exists, though divested of its character as a legal obligation under the operation, during the operation of the discharge. You know, all these, these bar members just come up with all sorts of stuff. You ought to watch my video on bar members because this is a great one for that. Because, so now what happens is when you use a Federal Reserve note, you discharge the debt with limited liability uh, and it's not paid. And so they can't sue you over it anymore because it's been discharged. <laughs> Anyways, this is a 1927 court case. Um, a dollar, the legal currency of the United States, the unit of money consisting of 100 cents, the aggregate of specific coins which add up to one dollar. Uh, in the absence of qualifying words, it cannot mean promissory notes, bonds, or other evidences of debt. Okay, and that's exactly what they're saying. Okay, this is found in uh, American jurisprudence. Um, uh, a promissory note is an evidence of debt. Okay, or bonds, and that is not a dollar. Uh, Banknotes uh, uh, constitute a large and convenient part of the currency of our country, and by common consent serve to a great extent all the purposes of coin. In themselves they are not money, for they are not a legal tender, and yet they are good tender unless specifically objected to as being notes merely and not money. And uh, it goes on, <clears throat> they subserve the purposes of money in the ordinary business of life by mutual consent, express or implied of the parties to a contract, and not by the binding force of any common usage. For the party to whom they may be tendered has an undoubted right to refuse accepting them as money. That's 1923. That's a court case. So, again, it's all voluntary. <clears throat> you do not have to accept them. Uh, banknote, a banknote uh, contract, a banknote resembles a common promissory note issued by a bank or corporation authorized to act as a bank. It is in fact a promissory note, but such notes are not for many purposes to be considered as mere securities for money, but are treated as money in the ordinary course and transaction of business by the general consent of mankind, Bouvier's 1856 edition. Consent, okay, I guess, you know, again, it's consent. It's everything's by consent. If you accept it, that's implied consent. A bank note is a bank-issued promissory note that's payable to bearer on demand, and that may circulate as money. Well, uh, that's a promissory note, but uh, not all bank notes are promissory notes, and that's Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, actually. Uh, money, um, <clears throat> gold, silver, uh, some other less precious metals, and the progress of civilization and commerce have become the common standards of value. In order to avoid the delay and inconvenience of regulating their weight and quality, whenever passed, the governments of the civilized world have caused them to be manufactured in certain portions and marked with a stamp which attests their value, which is called money. And that's taken from Book One of the Institutes of the Laws of England. That's like uh, Edward Coke again uh, in the 1500s. Um, and that's actually taken from Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 1856 edition. Um, Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, real money, money that has metallic or other intrinsic value as distinguished from paper currency, checks and drafts, current cash as opposed to money on account. Um, 
This is um, Jacob A. New Law Dictionary, 1750, citing uh, Sir Edward Coke's Littleton, page 207. Uh, again, that's 1500s. Is it look, so money is that metal, be it gold or silver, that receives authority by the prince's impress to be current. For a wax is not a seal without a print. Metal is not money without an impression. Promissory note: a written promise to pay a certain money, a sum of money at a future time unconditionally. A promissory note differs from a mere acknowledgement of debt without any promise to pay, as when a debtor gives his creditor an IOU. So, <laughs> Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 1856 edition. So then think about it. Um, these Federal Reserve notes or Bank of Canada notes that you see circulating around, they don't have a promise to pay on them. So therefore, they're an IOU by definition. It's nothing but an IOU. That's all it is, is an IOU. And that's what circulates for money these days. Um, this is taken from the Gold Reserve Act of 1934. Um, as used in this act, the term United States means the government of the United States. And then it goes on, it says the current term currency of the United States means currency, which is legal tender in the United States and includes United States notes and Federal Reserve notes. Now, think about that. What they're saying is Federal Reserve notes and, and United States notes are meant only for internal use of the government. And so when you use those things, they can presume you're a government employee. That's exactly what's going on here. Uh, section 16, um, it's another interesting point. The right to alter, amend, or repeal this act is hereby expressly reserved. And so, um, again, once that act was passed, it became set in stone. It can never be changed. It says here the right to alter, amend, or repeal this act is hereby expressly reserved. It cannot be repealed. It cannot be altered or amended. Okay? And... Um, and, and then it goes on to say, Section 17, all acts or parts of acts inconsistent with any of the provisions of this act are hereby repealed. In other words, it trumps everything. This is like, um, and again, Federal Reserve notes are only meant for internal use of the government. That is it. And if you use them, you're a government employee, or at least they can presume it until you defeat that presumption. Bank notes are a money substitute. Checks are a money substitute. A promissory note is a money substitute. Um, and this is actually uh, taken from a book uh, called The Non-Ratification of the 14th Amendment by this Judge A.H. Ella to the Utah Supreme Court. Uh, and this, this book is associated with this case, Diet versus Turner. Uh, anyways, don't forget that the term dollar reflects a unit of silver. When the term dollar is used with respect to gold, it becomes a comparative term between the value of gold and silver, with silver being the constant, and gold and cents being given in a respective value according to the true economic conditions. Script, Black's Law Dictionary, second edition. Script, certificates of ownership, either absolute or conditional, of shares in a public company, a script certificate. Uh, anyways, it, it kind of goes on here. Um, and, and it says here uh, at the bottom, it says, the term has also been applied in the United States to warrants or other like orders drawn on a municipal treasury and to the fractional paper currency issued by the United States during the period of the Civil War. So what they're talking about there is United States notes. Okay, remember I showed you a United States note that was issued by Kennedy. And so that's script. That's, that's exactly what it is. It's a script. And so... Again, you know, you need to understand the law and, and what's going on. You know, uh, there's a, a fundamental maximum of common law is that ignorance of the law excuses no one. Um, script, Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, a document that entitles the holder to receive something of value, money, especially paper money that is issued for temporary use. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, article of the Confederation, Article 4. Uh, to better secure the perpetua and perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse among the people of the different states in this union, the free inhabitants of each of these states, paupers, vagabonds, and fugitives from justice accepted, shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of free citizens in the several states, and the people of each state shall have free ingress and regress to and from any other state and shall enjoy therein all the privileges. So, the point here I'm trying to make is that... <coughs> Everybody gets to come and go as they please, except for paupers, vagabonds, and fugitives from justice. Okay? You gotta understand this, okay? Because what's a pauper? Okay? If all you have in your wallet 
is IOUs, then you don't have any money. And of, at common law, a pauper doesn't have any rights. And you don't have the right to travel. You're, you're nothing. And I don't care how many Federal Reserve notes you got in your wallet, you don't have anything. Those are just IOUs. That's all they are. Pauper, one so poor he must be supported at public expense. Well, think about it. Federal Reserve notes are meant for internal use of the government. So if you're using Federal Reserve notes, I don't care how many you got. You could have a billion of the things. You're still being supported at public expense. You're a government employee. You're being supported at public expense. Uh, a pauper, that's uh, Bouvier's 1856, Black's Law 8th edition. Uh, it says basically the same thing. A pauper, a very poor person, one who receives aid from charity or public funds. That's what Federal Reserve notes are meant for internal use of the government only. That cannot be changed. That act is set in stone. If all you have in your possession is Federal Reserve notes or Bank of Canada notes or any bank note, especially if it does not have a promise to pay, then you have no money and you are a pauper. And even at common law, a pauper has no rights. Government is not reason. It is not eloquence. It is force. It is a dangerous servant and a terrible master. The action of Congress in the passage of the First Legal Tender Act was placed distinctly upon the ground of the existing imperative need of government, and the Legal Tender Clause was urged and adopted as a war measure. Okay, well, this is the U.S. Supreme Court, and they're talking about the Civil War um, and the Legal Tender Acts. And, um, and uh, so what they're saying is that it's all because of martial law. Remember, we're talking about martial law you listen to that bar member video and we'll talk about how how it's under martial law there's an upcoming martial law video and and uh, so these 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 uh, uh, federal reserve notes and, and bank of canada notes are really military script um uh, same court case the forced loans of 1862 and 1863 in the form of legal tender notes were vital forces in the struggle for national supremacy they form a part of the public debt of the United States. So they're forced loans. They're, they're, now think about it. So you are forced to loan the government money. That's exactly what it is. You are forced to loan the government money. Um, uh, Bank of Canada notes are military script. Bank notes are legal tender. Or I should say bank notes are military script. Bank notes are legal tender. Bank notes are forced loans. Anybody who uses them is forced to loan the government money. Federal Reserve notes are not a promissory note. They are an IOU. And the same thing with Bank of Canada notes or any of these bank notes. When you pay for something with an IOU, you create a usufruct. It's a trust, okay? Because what you're essentially saying, think about it. You're essentially saying, some guy promised to pay me, and when he pays me, I'll pay you. Well, gee, that sounds like a trust. If the debt of the United States was paid off, there would be no paper money in circulation. Um, Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 1856 edition. Uh, private corporations, in the popular meaning of the term, never every corporation is public, and as much as they're created for the public debt. And so um, all corporations are owned by the government, are agencies of the government. There's Canadian statutes that say that all corporations are, are government property. Uh, the dollar symbol started out with a U superimposed over an S. Eventually it evolved to just uh, this dollar symbol which symbolizes a US dollar which is representing a certain weight of gold or silver coin. Because they had to differentiate between lawful money and IOUs circulating for money, the dollar symbol was changed. Most people didn't even notice. Today this symbol uh, symbolizes many currencies including a Canadian dollar, the U.S. dollar, Mexican peso. Matter of fact, some people call them pesos, <laughs> whether you're in Canada or the U.S. or Mexico. The courts presume that pesos were used unless you specify something else. Everything is in presumption. Unless you specify something else, they're going to presume pesos. It would be treason for the government to neglect to provide a way of to lawful pay for something, especially when it's in the Constitution. Uh, Canada has a Bills of Exchange Act. All governments provide gold or silver coin, uh, which is lawful money or real money. Equity. 
In the early history of the law, the sense of fixing this word was exceedingly vague and uncertain. This is owing in part to the fact that the chancellors of those days were either statesmen or ecclesiastics, perhaps not very scrupulous in the exercise of power. It was then asserted that equity was bounded by no certain limits or rules, and that it was alone controlled by uh, conscience uh, uh, and natural justice. And that's taken from Blackstone's Commentaries and Laws of England. Uh, well, that's where, uh, uh, but it's Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 1856 edition, that's citing it. Um, equity, a court of equity. A court of equity is one which administers justice where there are no legal rights or legal rights, but courts of law do not afford a complete, complete remedy and where the complainant also has an equitable right. Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 1856 edition. Now, so what you got to think about here now is a mortgage is a perfect example of this. A mortgage, the, the, uh, if you own land or property, real property, and it's mortgaged, then you have legal title and the mortgage company has equitable title. And so if the mortgage has to foreclose, they actually um, uh, automatically, by definition, they're, you're in a court of equity. Okay, you have to understand that. And a court of equity does, is not a common law court. And, and you have to understand that and, and what's going on and how it's happening. And so um, anyways, this is very important and this is important because because everything's in bankruptcy, so everything is an equity. And uh, equity is the system of law or body of principles originating in the English Court of Chancery and superseding the common and statute law, together called law in the narrow sense, when the two conflicting and appealing to the equity of the court, she's appealing to the king's conscience. Okay, so Black's Law Dictionary, 7th edition. And so, exactly, when, when, when you're, you're making equitable arguments, that's what the, uh, the bankster thieves are doing when they go and foreclose on a mortgage, is they're saying, well, we know that the law says this guy has the title, but, but he also uh, borrowed this money from us, so we want you to give us the house, and he's not making the payments. And so that's what, essentially what they're saying. You have to understand that. And so, uh, uh, so then how does that affect the bankster thieves? Okay, well, mortgages is a perfect example. Uh, but stocks, think about it. Everything is is in is equities. Okay, there's equities are called stocks are called equities. You hear about them on CNBC all the time. They call them equities, because because it's you just have an equitable interest in the company, um, be, and and they're paid for with the IOU. Think about it. You're paid for it with Federal Reserve notes. Uh, the, all corporations are agencies of the government, um, and because you just have an equitable interest in the company. And a mortgage holder has only has an equitable interest in the property. It's all about equity. And so what's the solution? Common law has all of the solutions we need. Common law is we the people. Common law is God's law is found in the Bible. Common law is 800 years of jury trial decisions in Old England. Common law is completely honest. That's why at common law only gold or silver coin are legal tender. Um, this is taken from uh, uh, the Title 12, United States Code, Section 411. Federal Reserve notes to be issued at the discretion of the Board of Governors uh, for the purpose of making advances to Federal Reserve Banks through Federal Reserve agents and here and after set forth, and for no other purpose are authorized. Remember, the Gold Reserve Act says it's for internal use of the government. And if you look in uh, Title 28, Section 3002, it says that... that, uh, that uh, uh, when you're suing the United States, it's a federal corporation or in any instrumentality of the United States, among other things, agencies and all sorts of things, but all banks are instrumentalities. The said note shall be obligations of the United States. So again, look what it's saying. Said note shall be obligations of the United States. So the, um, the uh, Federal Reserve notes are IOUs. That's what they're saying right here. And it's supposed to be redeemable and lawful money. The first one we looked at. It said on it. Well, they don't say it anymore, but it did say on it way back when. Um, the question is, can Congress issue paper and declare it to have unrelated value in gold or silver, or can it issue the same without redemption and force uh, these bills of credit to circulate among private citizens by operation of law? There is sufficient authority in the original Constitution to show that Congress was never intended to exercise such a power, at least not to exercise its power in such a way. And this is again taken from this non-ratification of the 14th Amendment by Judge A.H. Ellett, the Utah Supreme Court, uh, in this uh, case, Diet versus Turner. Um, so Federal Reserve notes are forced loans. Federal Reserve notes are IOUs. Federal Reserve notes are bills of credit. That's exactly what they are. 
when you buy something with a Federal Reserve note, you're buying it on the credit of the United States. Think about it. That's exactly what you are. It's an IOU. It's a bill of credit that's circulating around. So you're saying when you buy this house that you're buying it on United States credit. When you buy something on United States credit, who owns it? It's the United States that owns it. That's the reason they're demanding taxes. That's the reason that if they presume that you're using these Federal Reserve notes for everything, so they want to tax everything because you're a government employee and they're entitled to their tax. This is what's going on, boys and girls. In order for you to have the honest de jure government, you have to have honest measures. There are two kinds of title, legal title and equitable title. If you want to really own something at common law, then you have to really pay for it. These bankster thieves got the Federal Reserve passed in the middle of the night, and it took only 20 years to bankrupt the whole country. It is an established fact that the United States federal government has been dissolved by the Emergency Banking Act, March 9, 1933, by, declared by President Roosevelt being bankrupt and insolvent. Uh, House Joint Resolution 192, 73rd Congress, in session June 5, 1933, Joint Resolution to suspend the gold standard and abrogate the gold clause, dissolve the sovereign authority of the United States and the official capacities of all United States governmental offices, officers, and departments, and is further evidence that the United States federal government exists today in name only. That's taken from the U.S. Congressional Record, March 17, 1993. Now, get a load of this date. The uh, um, was dissolved by the Emergency Banking Act. The government went bankrupt in the March 9, 1933. Now, this is taken from the U.S. Senate report, dated uh, uh, November 19, 1973. Since March 9, 1933, gee, that sounds like when they went into bankruptcy, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the president may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, seize and control all transportation and communication, regulate the operation of private enterprise, restrict travel, and in a plethora of particular ways control the lives of all American citizens. A majority of the people of the United States have lived all their lives under emergency rule for 40 years. Freedoms and governmental procedures declared by the Constitution have in varying degrees been abridged by brought laws brought into force by states of national emergency. So bankruptcy creates martial law. That's exactly what it is, national emergency. And uh, uh, there's a martial law video that, that I'm going to put out that's upcoming, and, and it goes into it in more detail. But that's exactly what goes on. Uh, and this is actually, we saw this site earlier at Common Law, only gold and silver coin are legal tender. And, and that's extremely important. Um, if you use IOUs, Federal Reserve notes, Bank of Canada notes, or any kind of bank note, then you've taken yourself out of that Common Law jurisdiction. That's, you don't have access to Common Law, or at least they can presume it. And if they presume and you let them get away with it, then you don't have common law. That's why all these courts are UN de facto courts. That's why they're walking all over you like there's no tomorrow. That's why uh, uh, the de facto courts demand IOUs because they intend to deny, deny your common law rights. Please see my presentation on corruption in the courts three and my playlist on bar members and my upcoming uh, 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 corruption in the courts four. Because it is against public policy to pay a debt, the de jure government has gone into abeyance, okay? So the government is still there. The, 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 the Constitution creates a trust, okay? And that trust is still there. And, and you can have access to it. And that is strictly common law. And, and you are the king if you can get access to that government. But uh, otherwise, in, in bankruptcy, the, the government is now owned by the bankster thieves. And that's in a bar member video. Um, governments at all levels in America are in abeyance because it is uh, against public policy to pay a debt. All governments exclusively use Roman law of negotiable instruments and have no lawful authority, okay? And this is, this Roman law is, uh, negotiable instrument law is Roman law. We're going to go into that in a minute. The reason you're paying any taxes is because you're using a private money system. The way you avoid the tax is by not using the private money system. If you use gold or silver coin, it's a tax-free exchange. There was even a case in Nevada where some company was paying their employees 
with gold or silver coin, and the IRS uh, uh, went after them, and and IRS lost because they were using gold or silver coin. Governments descend to the level of mere private corporation and take on the characteristics of a mere private citizen where private corporate commercial paper and securities is concerned. Gee, that sounds like Federal Reserve notes. As a matter of fact, this particular case is involving a check. For purposes of suit, such corporations and individuals are regarded as entities entirely separate from government. Governments lose their immunity and descend to the level of private corporations when involved in commercial activity, enforcing negotiable instruments, as in fines, penalties, assessments, bails, taxes, and remedy lies in the hand of the state and its municipalities seeking remedy. When you buy something with gold or silver, you converted gold or silver to land uh, um, or whatever you bought, okay? So you don't say you buy it, okay, or purchase it. You exchanged it. You converted it. I've seen court cases that talk about it. Uh, you use a bill of exchange, not a bill of sale, because you ex exchange something of value for something else of value. Um, all contracts involving real property have to be in writing and notarized. Recently, there were pirates in Somalia that were assaulting shipping off the coast of Somalia. These pirates were captured by the U.S. Navy and brought back to New York for trial. It came out in the trial that these pirates were owned and operated by Goldman Sachs. It's the bankster thieves. Why do you think these bankster thieves are doing with all this money they're collecting in interest? They're using it to make war on us. Uh, here it is. Somali pirates, a subsidiary of Goldman Sachs. This is actually taken from the Daily Kos. Uh, the uh, Borowitz report. Um, and uh, let's get in closer. It says, uh, yeah, it says 11 indicted Somali pirates uh, dropped a bombshell in U.S. court today, revealing that their entire piracy operation is a subsidiary of banking giant Goldman Sachs. Uh, Borowitz says the pirates received bonuses last year amounting to 48 million paid cash in, in doubloons. Um, they merged with Goldman uh, in 2008 because uh, the more uh, lax regulation of bankers. So it's the bankster thieves that are doing this stuff. And what else are they doing? This is what they got caught with. This is another uh, uh, thing about that's the same uh, issue. Um, this is uh, Andy Borowitz on the Huffington Post. And it says, uh, 11 indicted Somali pirates dropped a bunch on the U.S. court today, revealing that their entire piracy operation is a subsidiary of banking giant Goldman Sachs. And listen to this. There was an audible gasp in court when the leader of the pirates announced, we are doing God's work. We work for Lloyd Blankfein. Well, gee, we all know that the bankster thieves are satanic, so which God are they talking about? It must be Lucifer. Um, um, so anyways, the pirates forcibly attacked ships that Goldman Sachs had already shorted. So it was a conspiracy. And the bankster thieves are exempt from most, a lot of these federal laws, so nothing ever came out of it, I see, as far as Goldman Sachs was concerned. They were just normal business as usual. It's these satanic bankster thieves. Don't get me going. Bankster thieves operate exclusively under Roman civil law. Negotiable instrument uh, law is a subset of Roman civil law. Mortgages are found in Roman law. Bankster thieves have brought us emergency rule for decades. Emergency rule is another terminology for martial law rule as found in the upcoming martial law presentation and video. We've been under martial law rule for decades. Please see the upcoming video on martial law. Uh, uh, this is a site from uh, uh, Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. Um, civil law, Roman law, and Roman civil law are convertible phrases, meaning the same system of jurisprudence. That rule of action which every particular nation, commonwealth or city, has established particularly for itself, more properly called municipal law. And so, think about it. If this all coming under Unidroit, and uh, Unidroit even talks about municipal law, and, uh, and this is all coming from uh, uh, the United Nations and the Vatican. Martial law precipitated the War of Independence. Uh, this is taken from the causes and necessities for taking up arms in 1775. Statutes have been passed extending the courts of admiralty and vice admiralty far beyond their ancient limits for depriving us of the accustomed and an inestimable privilege of trial by jury in cases affecting both life and property. And that's what got denied me in, in, this, in this show trial they had in Canada with the Canada border pigs. 
uh, uh, to suppress the, uh, the course of common law and instead thereof publish and order the use and exercise of the law marshal and for uh, altering fundamentally the form of government established by charter we saw the misery to which such despotism would reduce us that's all taken from the causes and necessities of taking up arms 1775 and if you think about it a despotism is a military dictatorship it's exactly what it is Martial law rule precipitated the War of Independence. Martial law rule precipitated the Magna Carta. The bankster thieves and their martial law rule has probably precipitated every war on the planet throughout history. Think about it. Who benefits from the war? It's the bankster thieves. How do the bankster thieves benefit from the war? Well, first of all, they finance both sides of the war. Then they get to seize the corporation that goes bankrupt, and they even make the winner pay for reconstruction. Talk about a scam. And it's all coming from these UN and the Vatican. The bankster thieves are tied with the United Nations under their Unidroid statute. Please see the corruption in the courts video, uh, uh, the bar member playlist, and the upcoming corruption in the courts four. Um, uh, the bankster thieves are tied in with their privately owned and operated bar, and their owned and operated bar member buddies as described in the bar member video. All courts in Canada and the United States are, are, are United Nations courts under the Unidroid Treaty and have been for over 30 years. All courts are de facto courts. There's no authority to delegate anything to the United Nations in the Constitution for the United States of America or the British North America Act. And uh, uh, see corruption in the courts three and four presentations for more information. Unidroid stands for the Unification of Private Law. And the website says that 63 countries have adopted it and it's designed to be automatically implemented. Canada and United States have been signatories to the Unidroid Treaty for over 30 years. The Unidroid website says nothing about Texas or Arizona or any of the American states or the Canadian provinces. Therefore, a Unidroid application in the American states or the Canadian provinces is only in federal areas. Unidroid covers negotiable instruments. Gee, that sounds like the banks are thieves. Civil procedure. Uh, uh, civil liability, gee, that sounds like the banks are thieves. Secured transactions, gee, that sounds like the banks are thieves. Legal status of women, maintenance obligations, contracts, banking law, gee, that sounds like the banks are thieves. Uh, uh, transportation, leasing, franchising, hotel, insurance, gee, that sounds like the banks are thieves. Anything related to marriage, divorce, children, municipal law, gee, that sounds like the banks are thieves. All it's all Roman civil law. Canada and the United States are signatories to the Unidroid Treaty as of this date. 63 countries have signed it and see corruption in the courts 3 and 4 for more information. Texas is not listed. Arizona is not listed. No American states listed. Alberta is not listed. British Columbia is not listed. Ontario is not listed. No Canadian province is listed. It's interesting to note that in Ontario they have in their logo and on the plates, license plates and all that, a crown. But that crown does not have ER superimposed over it. Therefore, it's not Elizabeth's crown, the queen. It's the Vatican. Anyways, to go on. Therefore, anything involving motor vehicles or courts is both commercial and federal, and therefore by consent. And this is the Unidroid website. Uh, this is a, a big picture. Let's get in closer. Uh, commercial contracts, cultural property, franchising. Uh, the next page, and we'll get in bigger. Leasing, security interest, transport, banking law, capital markets, civil procedure, contracts, cultural property, franchising, hotel keepers, insurance, intellectual property, leasing, legal status of women, maintenance obligations, movement of persons. Gee, that sounds like airlines. Uh, and, and the transportation also sounds like airlines. Uh, and negotiable instruments. Um, Unidroid covers mandatory insurance for motor vehicles anything related to marriage, divorce, and children. And this is actually taken from uh, uh, another part of their website. It talks about the 1955 Benelux Treaty on compulsory insurance against civil liability in respect to motor vehicles. And it talks about uh, another 1958 convention uh, concerning the recognition and enforcement of decisions relating to maintenance obligations towards children. Um, and, and it goes on and on. And this is actually taken from Title 18, United States Code, Section 31. And, and so in the, federal, in the federal statute, it's actually pretty good because it defines it pretty well. It says the term motor vehicle means every description of carriage or other contrivance propelled or drawn by mechanical power and used for commercial purposes. And, and then it defines what commercial purposes is. It's carrying passengers or property for hire. And that is it. And so 
Therefore, if you're not carrying uh, passengers or property for hire, you don't have a motor vehicle. And yet there are hired thugs go out and stop us and assault us all the time. And, and look in the uh, video on peace officers, and, uh, and it explains it uh, better. Uh, anyways, and I'm going to do an upcoming video on right to travel as well. Uh, Texas Transportation Code, speed signs. The department shall erect and maintain the highways and roads of this state appropriate signs to show the maximum lawful speed for commercial motor vehicles, truck tractors, truck trailers, semi truck semi trailers, and motor vehicles engaged in the business of transporting for compensation for hire. Okay, so it doesn't say anything about someone traveling, does it? Uh, and and uh, further evidence that that uh, that uh, uh, it's uh, it's that stuff is commercial and traveling is not is. The reason for the initial detention, speeding and running a red light, are not a breach of the peace. And so uh, uh, that's all going to be in my uh, uh, right to travel video and uh, and also in my corruption, or no, uh, fire the whores in Texas video. Uh, Canada and United States are signatories to the Unidroid Treaty. As of this date, 63 countries have signed on to the Unidroid Treaty. And this one has, shows Canada, and this one shows United States and United Kingdom. Anything in America... Uh, uh, involving motor vehicles or the courts or the banks or finance or municipal corporations is actually federal and falls under Unidroid. There's, and this is another good, this is a court case that talks about it. There has been created a fictional federal state of within a state. And so what they're saying is there's two states. There's at least two of them. And so there's a state of Texas in upper lower case, and there's a state of Texas in all block capital letters. And the state of Texas in all block capital letters is a federal province really a federal territory and uh, and if you're in that territory you're a slave you're a corporation you're a slave that's the, what these judicial whores do when you get into their kangaroo court they're busy fabricating evidence that you're one of their slaves uh, this is a site taken from Thomas Jefferson <clears throat> I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will go up around, the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. This issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Well, gee, how, uh, uh, isn't it obvious that that is exactly what's happened? Uh, this is actually Robert H. Hemphill, credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta for eight years. If all bank loans were paid, no one would have a bank deposit and there would not be a dollar of currency or coin in circulation. This is a staggering thought. We are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have into circulation, cash or credit. If the banks create ample synthetic money, we're prosperous. If not, we starve. We are absolutely without a permanent monetary system. When one gets a complete grasp of the picture, the tragic absurdity of our hopeless position, it is almost incredible. But there it is. It, the banking problem, is the most important subject intelligent persons can investigate and reflect upon. It is so important that our present civilization may collapse unless it is widely understood and the defects remedied very soon. Uh, this is Churchill's chief counselor, Robert Lord uh, uh, Van Sittart, September 1940, uh, to Foreign Minister Lord Halifax. Quote, the enemy is the German Reich and not Nazism, and those who still haven't understood this haven't understood anything. The reason they made war on Hitler was because he was printing his own money. He wasn't borrowing it from the banks or thieves, and we're going to go into that. Uh, Winston Churchill uh, the Second World War, Bern, 1960, I think that's his book. Uh, anyways, Germany's unforgivable crime before World War II was its attempt to loosen its economy out of the world trade system and to build up an independent exchange system from which the world finance couldn't profit anymore. We butchered the wrong pig. And, uh, and so what he's saying is, is that Germany didn't want to play with the bankster thieves. And so they went and the bankster thieves got, you know, these... Uh, these uh, sheeple to go and attack Germany, and that's what Hitler's saying is we butchered the wrong pig. Um, Major General General uh, J.F.C. Fuller, uh, historian of England, not the political doctrine of Hitler has hurled us 
into this war. The reason was the success of his increase in building a new economy. The roots of war were envy, greed, and fear. And that's basically affirming what, uh, what Churchill said. U.S. Foreign Minister James Baker, 1992. I remember him. Boy, that's dating myself, I guess. Uh, uh, we made a monster, a devil out of Hitler. Therefore, we couldn't disavow it after the war. After all, we mobilized the masses against the devil himself. So we were forced to play our part in this diabolical scenario after the war. In no way we could have point, pointed out to our people that the war was only an economic preventative measure. In other words, it, had, it was bankster thieves. Uh, Winston Churchill to Truman. Uh, 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 March 1946. The war wasn't only about abolishing fascism, but to conquer sales markets. We could have, if we intended to, prevent this war from breaking out without doing one shot, but we didn't want to. And, you know, you think about it. You know, they sat by while uh, the, the uh, Khmer Rouge murdered two million people in Cambodia, and nobody cared. So, uh, and how many other atrocities have gone on? You know, so the fact that Hitler killed off a bunch of Jews... You know, however many it is, I don't know. But, uh, you know, there's a debate. I'm not saying it was six million. I'm not saying it wasn't. I mean, it could have been. I don't know. But uh, there's a debate. At any rate, he, he definitely killed some. And uh, in my opinion, if he killed one, it's, a, it's an a, a atrocity. Uh, one innocent person is an atrocity. Anyways, so, uh, 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 but what he's saying is that it had nothing to do with, with anybody's freedom or rights or protecting anybody, it was all about commerce, about the bankster thieves. The American Revolution was primarily fought over King George III's Currency Act, uh, quote, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system, which freed the ordinary man from clutches of the money manipulators, was probably the prime cause of the revolution, and that's Benjamin Franklin. Now, you think about it, money manipulators, that sounds like the bankster thieves, or the money changers, same thing, right? This is uh, Colonel Edward Mandel House in a private meeting with Woodrow Wilson. This is going to be over a couple pages because it's quite lengthy. Very soon, every American will be required to register their biological property in a national system designed to keep track of the people and that will operate under ancient system of pledging. By such methodology, we can compel people to submit to our agenda, which will affect their security as a chargeback to our fiat paper currency. Gee, that sounds like he's talking as a bankster thief. Every American will be forced to register or suffer not being able to work and earn a living. They will be our chattel, and we will hold the security interest over them forever by operation of law merchant under the scheme of secured transactions. Gee, that sounds like Unidroit. Americans, by unknowingly or unwittingly delivering the bills of lading to us, will be rendered bankrupt and insolvent forever to remain economic slaves through taxation secured by their pledges. Gee, that sounds like the Unidroit and the bankruptcy. They will be stripped of their rights and given a commercial value designed to make us a profit. And they will be none the wiser for not one man in a million could ever figure out our plans. And if by accident one or two figured out, we have in our arsenal plausible deniability. After all, this is the only logical way to fund government by floating liens and debt to the registrants in the form of benefits and privileges. This will inevitably reap to us huge profits beyond our wildest expectations and leave every American a contributor to this fraud by which we will call social insurance. Without realizing it, every American will insure us for any loss we may incur, and in this manner, every American will unknowingly be our servant, however begrudgingly. The people will become helpless and without any hope for their redemption, and we will employ the high office of president of our dummy corporation to foment this plot against America. Gee, that sounds like the bankster thieves, and that sounds like the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, oh, that, that agreement that started the Federal Reserve and all of that. I am a most, this is Woodrow Wilson. After they passed the Federal Reserve Act, which instituted the fractional reserve system in the United States, quote, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. 
a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. Well, gee, it sounds like Wilson is, is uh, um, uh, where does he say it? He says, um, he says that, um, oh, oh, he says, the people will become helpless and without any hope for their, for their redemption, and we will employ the high office of president of our dummy corporation. So Wilson's the president of their dummy corporation. The, you know, don't get me going. Anyways, after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was forced to repay the cost of the war and was bankrupt. Hitler's crime was that he did not borrow money from the banks to thieves, and he printed it. And as a result, the German economy was turned around in less than three years. Kennedy circulated. Kennedy understood that. There's a video, a YouTube video, about a speech he gave like two weeks before he was murdered. Kennedy circulated $6 billion of U.S. Treasury notes and Johnson's first act while on the plane from D.C. to Dallas after the assassination was to recall those notes. Lincoln was killed because he circulated U.S. Treasury notes. President Garfield was killed because he wanted to circulate U.S. Treasury notes. Un under Gaddafi, Libya had debt-free currency and they had him killed. And the first thing they did is install a Rothschild bank. Saddam Hussein was preparing to circulate gold-backed debt-free currency until he was killed. Christ was killed three days after he threw the money changers out of the temple. The bankster thieves will stop at nothing to keep their power. There are two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by the sword and the other is by debt. The money powers prey upon the nation in times of peace and conspire against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, and more selfish than bureaucracy. It denounces its public enemies, all who question its methods or throw light upon its crimes. As a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned, an era of corruption in high places will follow, and the money powers of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. Boy, Abraham Lincoln said it all there, didn't he? When injustice becomes law, then resistance becomes duty. If there's any, is there any wonder why Christ threw the banks of thieves out of the temple in his day? I mean, Christ even called them thieves. The bankster thieves will force all government, and this is just one alternative, and, and, uh, and this is actually, I think, what Hitler did, except he probably didn't call them labor certificates, and what Kennedy did, except he didn't call them labor certificates. Anyways, the bankster thieves will force all governments into bankruptcy, either by internal intrigues or by getting a foreign government to make war on the Jejure government. In order to stay out of bankruptcy, the government needs the capability to have access to resources beyond gold and silver, but at the same time, lawful payment was, must always be made. Labor is, not, is just as valuable as gold or silver, and labor is not commercial or taxable. And uh, uh, this is taken from Title 15, United States Code, Section 17. The labor of a human being is not a commodity or article of commerce. Why do you think, when you fill out an income tax re uh, form, that they want to know your occupation? I mean, how many people put down that they're a laborer, you know? I mean, even laborers probably have some technical name for them. Anyways, the right to pursue happiness is the right to get compensation for labor. This is a Butcher's Union Company versus Crescent City, Colorado, a U.S. Supreme Court case. Among these unalienable rights is proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence is the right of men to pursue their happiness, by which is meant the right any lawful business or vocation in any manner not inconsistent with the equal rights of others, which may increase their prosperity or develop their faculties so as to give them their highest enjoyment. It has been well said that the property which every man has is his own labor. The same case, the patrimony of the poor man lies in the strength and dexterity of his own hands and to hinder his employing his strength and dexterity in what manner he thinks proper without injury to his neighbor is a plain violation of the most sacred property. Uh, and this is another case. The right to follow any of the common occupations of life is an inalienable right and was formulated as such under the phrase pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence. A labor certificate that would, would certify that one dollar's worth of labor had been performed or ten dollars, whatever, the government would give them to their employees as compensation for labor. A labor certificate would not be a promissory note or a bank note because there is no promise to pay. It's not issued by the bank. The labor has already been performed. A labor certificate would not be an IOU or any debt because in order to get it issued, a dollar's worth of labor had to be already performed. 
a labor certificate which certify that $1 as defined by the Coinage Act of 1792 of labor has been performed. A labor certificate would just be just as valuable as a $1 coin. A labor certificate would be lawful money. So that's actually I have a presentation on uh, uh, the pursuit of happiness and, uh, and I'll upload that here one of these days too. Um, we can refuse. What can we do? So what can we do? Other things we can do besides the labor certificates. We can refuse to participate in their de facto system. We can educate ourselves about what a common law jury is and what the law of the land is. We can educate ourselves so we know when our rights are being violated. We can educate our public servants because many of them do not know any more than we do. We can educate other people by circulating this video and any other way that is appropriate. We can demand a common law jury of our peers. We can work with our friends and neighbors to reestablish our common law juries and our common law de jure courts. We can work with our friends and neighbors to get the United Nations out of America and Canada and everywhere that wants to be free. The United Nations is owned and operated by the bankster thieves and their Vatican handlers. We can move away from their IOUs, their Federal Reserve notes and their Bank of Canada notes and work towards using lawful money gold or silver coin. There's an organization called lifeleadership.com and, and I highly recommend everybody go there and check it out. It's, 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 they talk about uh, uh, there's AFs and one of them is freedom and, and, and one of the things that they talk about is uh, so there's got to be a balance but it's only really three to five percent of the people who do anything. It was three to five percent of the people that precipitated the American Revolution and it's the bankster thieves and their cronies are 3 to 5% of the people. Historically, every 100, give or take, years, there is a major change in our freedoms. It's called a world shift. And uh, in 1778, the uh, U.S. Constitution, uh, it, the world shifted towards more freedom. In 1915, uh, when the Federal Reserve was created, the world shift uh, was to more force on the part of government. And we're in the middle of one right now, and it's yet to be seen how it all plays out. Um, what Life Leadership does is they provide uh, educational material about what the issues are. They provide a way, they provide DVDs and CDs. They provide a way of bringing people together, and they provide a way of generating, re generating revenue through network marketing. And this is their webpage, and there's the five, eight Fs, Faith, Family, Finances, Fitness, Following, Freedom, Friends, and Fun. And so... I mean, there has to be a balance. You have to have a balance. You can't just be focused on freedom because uh, if you don't, uh, if you're in bondage because of finances, then freedom doesn't help you much. Um, so, so it's it's all of them all working together, and and your family's important too, and so it's all of them all working together. Um, anyway, some of the D CDs and DVDs that are available cover a Rascal, Rascal Radio, potential constitutional changes. Uh, leadership development. They uh, Their leadership development programs are actually used, that's following actually under the 8S, it's actually used by s some uh, airlines and other corporations use their leadership development. Um, financial fitness, adversity, success, balance in our life. We need to balance spiritual, financial, everything. Uh, they do not just sign you up and leave you on your own. They put people under you as a team effort. Their material, the CDs are not overly expensive. Most of these these organizations that do this kind of thing sell their stuff for way more than 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 what it should sell. They, like a CD in this case is ten bucks. I mean that's that's very reasonable for a, a, a CD that's going to give you some some great information. And and if you get a set of four, it's like fifty bucks. So uh, uh, you know uh, there's other uh, people that that uh, uh, sell these motivational CDs that it'll be three hundred and fifty bucks for for uh, uh, for you know twelve. And so um, these guys don't do that. And they, they have books available, and, and they want you to, as part of the leadership program, is to listen to the CDs and to read the books. Um, and what they'll do is they'll put people under you. It's a team effort. They want you to be 10 people deep. Uh, their chart show 20, 30, and 50, and 75 deep. You need to be successful so you can be an influence. Uh, they want leaders, and they want to affect this world change that's a world shift that's coming up. And, 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 and try and affect it so that it's towards freedom. We need 3 to 5% of the people so we can work together to affect the change towards freedom, the world ship. They have meetings every Tuesday night in DFW at the Omni Hotel at I-635. Um, 
uh, exit east of uh, George Bush Toll Road at 8 o'clock. And, uh, and there's other meetings. You can contact me if you have any uh, want to know. Uh, there's uh, upcoming events um, that I'm going to be doing. There's one on martial law. There's one on right to travel. Uh, there's one on color of law. There's one I don't have listed here called pursuit of happiness. Um, there's one on the uh, Canada border pigs. There's one on fire the horse in Canada. There's corruption in the courts poor. Fire the horse in Texas. City of Fort Worth pigs. City of Grand Prairie pigs. Um, you can get copies of these documents at my private group at Yahoo uh, called Administrating Your Public Servants. I also have other YouTube videos, uh, which if you're watching this one, you probably know that. Uh, and you can also email me uh, if you're interested in um, uh, anything else. And I appreciate you listening and uh, have a nice day.